Ah, there we are. Is this ice good? Oh, good, good, great. Yes, lovely. So, uh, well, shall I begin now talking about it? Yes, please. Thank All you. All right. Well, this piece about the sea is not the first piece I wrote because from 1964 to 1968, I was teaching English in Athens under the auspices of the British Council. And most weekends, Greeks would either go up into the mountains and uh, collect spring water from their beautiful springs they honored so much, or they would get on the boats to to the various islands. Now I was with a college friend and we thought, oh, we must try to go to as many islands in our four years as we can possibly get to. So you'd set out from the harbor and when I was there, all the Greeks would then start praying. And I thought, why are they all starting to pray? You know, the sea looks all right. <laughs> and then of course, the Aegean Sea is very capricious it's even worse in the summer because the Meltemi uh, blows. And I went to Patmos in 1970 when I went back for a short time to Greece. And uh, we were in a force eight gale and I thought my end had come. So this poem is as a result of all these experiences I had on all these rough seas and uh, sometimes they were very smooth, very, very beautiful. But I wanted this poem to encapsulate the two ideas of the power of the sea and its terrifying qualities and its calmness. And that is also related to the tides the ebb and flow of the tides, and we must remember that all of this is controlled by the moon. And I am planning to do a really complex recording of this. I've got a lovely recording studio just 12 miles away. And in the spring, I want to do that in which we have a lot of tracks and we actually bring my Lunar Aria song into it as well. So that's behind this particular text. Now, if we just look at the, the words of the line, the first line, it says, restlessness urge ceaselessly. Then there's a little pause. Then restlessness urge cease. So that is like two waves. There's a big wave, and then there's a smaller wave, and then it goes quiet. Now, I've performed this piece many, many times. I used to work a great deal in schools for Southern Arts. So there were school children from the age of about five, six up to, to, to the sixth form. And then I used to work in art colleges and art centers, very rarely in um, literature departments because they would still go on and still go on saying this is proper, this is not proper poetry. Now the first word restlessness is a very fascinating one. It's um, three four letter Anglo-Saxon words. Well we don't call it Anglo-Saxon anymore, we call it Old English. But rest is an old English word relating to Old German and Old Norse, and it is a unit of measurement. It is one mile. Rust is a mile, and after you'd walked a mile, it was reckoned that you would either sit down if you could, or you might lean against a tree, get your breath back, and then set off on another rest or mile. So rest is the quiet word of the piece. It stops action. It is quiet and peaceful. Then rest less. Those two, those four little letters there, less means the opposite. You know, like hope and hope less. Hopeless, you don't have any hope at all. So rest less, you haven't got any rest. You you are then more than restless, it's restlessness. And that another four letter word, that means something complete, like happy 
or happiness. Happiness is a complete state of being happy. So restlessness, I would tell anybody who was groups who would come with me to perform it, one group go up one part of the room and keep saying rest, rest rest the other lot would go in another area of the room and they say restless 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 a third group would go into a third part of the a big hall i would always get in school and they would say restlessness restlessness and if you say that often enough it starts to make you feel quite queasy now the vowel sound in those three words are all e's but it goes it then changes restlessness so you've got a huge low vowel sound which brings all the powerful destructive energy into the poem so surge ceaselessly it will never never stop the sea will always batter the land it batters it so much that the rocks gradually 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 turn to sand sand is just rocks that are battered by the sea over aeons and uh, and have turned into sand so after that very ferocious statement about the power of the sea we have a, a a smaller wave and that one says restlessness surge cease now we've got a, a, a pun in that it could be s-e-a-s -E seas or cease and within the word cease there is the word ease so the poem then goes very very quiet and so i suggest that maybe if you would like to join in a bit um we could say the statement over and over again again and then you will hear me beginning to fragment the sound so that all the uh, elementary particles of language are then heard and they appear to be well sometimes people call them concrete and others call it rather bewilderingly an abstract sound but anyhow it fragments almost like the sea breaking down the rocks and turning it all into sand and then gradually it comes back again now this piece when i'm with a large group of people in a large space they can wander all over the place i mean schools often groups would then go into other classes if it was a poetry day and the poem would go all over the place we'd go outdoors but here just for a few minutes uh, may we give it a whirl sounds wonderful yeah let's try it yep okay wonderful so everybody thank you okay shall we go Restlessness, uh, ceaselessly. Restlessness, 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 Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Works. I've Thank never you ever so much. It before. Lovely. It works.
That was absolutely wonderful. I have never seen Zoom used this way. Thank you so much, Paula. We're so lucky. <laughs> so our next reader is the wondrous Susan Howe, who is joining us from Guilford, Connecticut. Um, she trained as a visual artist at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and later moved to New York in the 1960s. Um, she, in an interview in the Paris Review, describes her early explorations with words and images as follows. And I hope she doesn't mind that I'm quoting her here. She says, I started making lists of single words, usually nouns, bird names, or place names often cut from books and collaged with pencil lines and watercolor washes. I began incorporating old engineering instruction manuals, maps, and charts. Single words and the letters that formed them were what attracted me. Gradually, I came to make books of watercolor stains, photographs, and words. After a time, I just used words on drawing paper or pasted on walls. It was as though I had a book of the wall. Eventually, at the suggestion of poet Ted Greenwald, she took her works off the wall and put them onto the page, composing her first book, Hinge Picture, from 1974. And the works in the anthology are from Hinge Picture. Ever since, her work has been characterized by the use of collage, found language, and typographical innovations. Howe is an avid researcher of historical archives, manuscripts, and marginalia, and a concern with American history is also consistent, is a consistent element throughout her work. Her poetry spans almost five decades, beginning with her early books from the 1970s, which were collected in frame structures, published in 1996, but of course it's all the books earlier than that. Um, and New Directions has published 13 of her collections, including the most recent, Concordance, which is fresh off the press almost, right? It came out earlier this year. Um, other books include Depths, Spontaneous Particulars, The Telepathy of Archives, Souls of the Labadee Tract, The Midnight, Pierce Arrow, and the groundbreaking critical books, um, My Emily Dickinson and The Birthmark, Unsettling the Wilderness in, the American literary, in American Literary History. She is the recipient of the Bollingen Prize for Poetry in 2011, her work has been exhibited at Yale Union in Portland, Oregon, and the Whitney Biennial in 2014. And she has collaborated with musician David Grubbs on four albums. So please welcome Susan Howe. Thank you, Susan. Okay, can, am I unmuted now? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. That's great. Um, I'm a little embarrassed by my the piece that's in your anthology because it um it was it very early and um i was just moving from paint from um visual to um to, to words and um i i i i just don't think i think that um my work has over time become more and more um visually interesting on the page and radical but um at the same time i um am more and more uh through my work with emily dickinson and her late fragments and which are you don't know what to say about them you don't know are they visual are they verbal are they uh, what, 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 what were her final intentions? Can you say what they were? They're just such a mystery. And trying to um, edit or explain, I, I got deeply into working in archives and the mystery of archives. And what I, the thing about her work that is so mysteriously wonderful to me is the ear and the I, the mystery of how are the ear and the eye separated? That every mark on a page is in some way an acoustic mark. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, anyway, it's just a profound mystery. And the more, and so concrete poetry for me, um, I'm not, I can't call myself a concrete poet because I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by the mystery of 
as Paula has just been um, uh, doing with her work here and, and reading, um, are they are they are they just words uh, letters on the page? Are they music? Where is a word music? And uh, the the collaborations I've been doing with um, David Grubbs have led me more into the idea of field recording and uh, and sound. Anyway, I don't know what to say, but I thought I would read not. Um, I, I would read not from the book, from my mo very most recent book, which really, it has a long poem called Concordance, which is made from, it's basically cut from coll uh, word collages from concordances, you know, concordances of fa famous poets. Um, it's now a thing of a past, really, these old concordances that had these endless word lists, um, particularly um, uh, Milton's Paradise Lost, say, or, or the work of Milton. And what the concordance, you know, it just has the word, how each word and how many times it was used and what, which line. So you see, um, you see it in a different way. And um, the interesting thing about concordances is that they are basically about famous men, unless you, they're concordance of the work, unless you come to someone like Emily Dickinson, or you probably have a concordance to the Brontes. Um, but at any rate, um, there is a concordance to Dickinson, and she loved her concordance to Shakespeare, and um, anyway, the work from of concordances actually is very often done by women laboriously collecting every word and every, you know, the line it comes from. And that interested me. But anyway, I, I'm going to read um, a few things from this poem. Um, concordance and I must say it's in a you know it's in a new directions book and I do run into the problem that many of you make of being told oh but this is meaningless what what do you what this is not a book of poetry because I am presenting it in a book of you know quote unquote poetry not concrete co poetry and that is not allowed. It's very upsetting. It's very upsetting to everybody. <laughs> so you remain kind of marginal. But anyway, um, I'm deeply, I, I cut and pasted I, um, and put these Xerox and put these things together. I don't work with, um, you know, um, I don't work on the computer with, uh, all the elaborate things. It's basically a cut and paste job. And um, so, uh, you know, I don't have Photoshop or InDesign. Okay, so um, let's see. Uh, I'll just read a few now, I've gone on too long. <laughs> okay. Concordances, I may remark, are hunting down half remembered worthy service. They contribute. Mm, history of words, and so to the and such assistance from them. And, 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 the age, the famous, 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 the combat. Fragments. Feed and shelter it. And when I was still another behest, which it, nevertheless I endured it. Why? T. Which gave us our body. Takes it. Bear it. I love it, says somebody. Was just now saying, 
Is it not natish, this very affection? But the says, let it go now and have with it. 224. Bay leaved, Bedford, crack, creeping, cricket bat, dark leaved, dwarf, French, golden, Lapland, net leaved, saddlers, tea leaved, tree small, weeping, white, whortle leaf, woolly, willows, withy. Alphabet of stars alone does. Lost notebook. Echo, echo. I love you. Breathe, breathe. Eden, or so without was done. Desire of knowledge, W. Bounds. And bid the deep, W. Appointed, R.W., them, spirit, lived. Out, W., those banks where rivers, mm, air are approaching, heard, W., shh, fish, W., their watery residence, pressing well the spirit, W., the W. No outward aid required. Uh, active W. Beyond the sense. Peace W. Favor from itself. The danger lies, yet lies W. Mm -hmm. As to the power that dwelt, W, forcible, W, my heart I feel the hermit thrush, sparrow, 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 sparrow. Sparrow, 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 starling, swallow, swallow, swallow. That's that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Beautiful. Thank you very much, um, Susan Howe. And um, now the, the next poem, poem and, and, and poet who we will present and welcome um, is Lillian Line. Uh, thank you, Lillian, for being with us together uh, tonight. And um, a, a few words that seem to be in movement when, when speaking of your words, sound, light, machine, energy, language, movement. Uh, game as well, which are keywords to maybe um, approach and engage with your amazing work um, between poetry, art, uh, language. So thank you for being with us tonight, and we will um, we will maybe see and hear uh, a work that is done with a poem cone. Um, actually, I didn't prepare. They're behind. Some of them are behind. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the ones I'm working on now are all, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'll just speak briefly about something I'm working on now, because of course that's always exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I, at the moment I'm actually working on a myth, uh, the, the myth of Inanna, who was uh, a 5,000 year old myth, which I felt was really the life cycle, uh, a, a, a female life cycle, a fantastic female life cycle. Um, she was um, a goddess, goddess of heaven and earth, who actually um, <clears throat> went to the underworld, not because she was raped or taken there or, or seduced there or uh, went there to find uh, somebody. She actually went there because she wanted to find out something. 
because she was curious, because she wanted to understand. Um, and uh, so I think it's a primary myth, which has been completely neglected and was for 50 years in fragments in, all over the world in different archeologists uh, uh, <clears throat> sort of boxes. And they never got together to put the myth together until about 15 years ago or so. And um, when I read it, I was knocked out. And I thought I would um, do the myth as a series of poem cons. They're not really finished, I can't even show them to you. But um, the, I'm telling the story because it's such a weird story. Because I wanted to use the original uh, glyphs, uh, the pictograms. I didn't, um, I didn't want to use the later developed language, um, cuneiform language, which was very, quite well known. And, um, and I came across completely by chance uh, um, the, the manual, the main manual uh, of uh, Akkadian language. And uh, I was fascinated by it. And this many years ago, I started studying it. And then I thought, well, I'll, I'll use the, um, the glyphs and I'll make a series of cones. And so it's, there are 21 cones. They're quite small, but it's, it's called Inanna's Altar. And on it, there, there are these glyphs. Um, and it turns out that it was never actually written in these glyphs. So it turns out I'm actually the first person to produce this poem in, 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 in pictograms. Uh, because originally it was completely oral and was not written down. The only thing that was written in pictograms were business letters. Which is also quite interesting, I think, that the first written language was not poetry, was not religious prayers, it was business. So that, that tells us something, I think, you know. Um, so, um, well, a little bit about my work. My work's quite varied, and I've, I, but, I, but I have used text and language and poetry uh, since... Oh, since, since the early 60s, 62, well, since I was about 19, so about uh, 59, really. Um, and um, I, uh, I, I, I brought a piece that's from uh, probably 63, when I was also living in Greece. We, we were living in Greece at the same time, Paula. <laughs> well, sort of, yeah. Where I lived are you? Where are you in Greece? <laughs> I lived in Greece from six, uh, 63 on and off, mainly on, till 67, yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> where, where? I was in Athens. I was in, well, I was in Athens, and then I, I built a house with my ex-husband, Takis, oh, right. um, in Yerovuno, which was on the way to Mount Parnitha. Oh, so I, I had this house. extraordinary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, Yasu, Yasu, <laughs> Yasu. yasu. <laughs> so I mean, I, I, uh, so I had a very varied life and a varied, uh, varied work, and my work is involved in sculpture. But I have continued working with words throughout yes. and um, developing word games um, and uh, poems and uh, whether I don't know whether they're concrete or not. I really, um, I leave the the do denominations to people who do that. Um, I, I just, I, what, what I basically was interested in when I made the poem machines, which was in 62, 63, um, was actually transforming, um, transforming visual words into sound, but not sound that you could hear, sound that you could see. And that's why I, I kind of related also to Susan. Uh, mm -hmm. what you were saying about sound and the word being sound. Uh, because of course, that's where it starts with vibration. Yes. And, and, and so I wanted to make words that, I wanted to make them vibrate. And a friend of mine, Nasli Noor, uh, who was a wonderful poet, and, uh, <clears throat> and in, in, at that time in Paris, actually, in, in uh, 1962, 63, um, she, she wanted to have her words move. So she said, I'd like you to make my words move. 
So I took, but she wrote these really long poems. That, I mean, they were pages long and uh, they were more like kind of prose poems. And I, I, I couldn't use such long text. So I said, uh, what am I gonna do? She said, oh, well, do whatever you want. So I cut them up actually. So it was a kind of, if you like, a real collaboration because I took her, her poems and cut them up and did what I wanted with them. And she was happy with that. Um, uh, so with this, this particular one is, uh, I mean, I, I, I did a few other poets as well, not just her. And then I started uh, using my own text. Um, but I don't know if you can see this. It's, yeah, we can see it. It's more letters. <laughs> so it's called Sound, Rain, Free Future. And, and when it spins, oh, lovely. I will make it spin. Oh, and that's super. <laughs> yeah, love it. Right, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. Um, right, yes, now it's type big there. You can probably see it better than me. Wonderful. Uh, oop, I'm wobbly, so problematic. Um, I think. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, it's a mirror image, so I can't have that. <laughs> <laughs> so it, <clears throat> I can read a bit. So I'll read it when it stops. Yeah. Whoops. Sa sun pollen vibrates, sound, rain, free future. Explode, Vulcan, rotate, fields, time, memory, earth, memory, today. Cool. <laughs> it's lovely. <laughs> time, earth, memory, today. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> oh. Right. So, and you see, I made these in Greece. I, 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 di I didn't have any electricity. Um, my still there. Um, I didn't have any electricity, so um, I devised this way of of using bearings uh, on a stick oh, right. and rotating yeah. uh, a bow. And and then there were these young well, there were people young people coming from India, Nepal, and um, I met a number of them in Athens. I don't know if you did, Susan. Um, no, it wasn't. Sorry. <laughs> um, yes. And, um, and they, they told me, they told me about um, Tibetan prayer wheels. Oh, right. Yes. yes. And I didn't know anything about Tibetan prayer wheels. And, um, and yet these were very similar. Uh, only the, the words were on, on the surface and not on the inside. Yeah. Um, and they weren't prayers necessarily. Although I think vibration, that for me, vibration is the essence of the universe. Yeah. And I, I, I've always thought so, and I recently found out it is, actually. Well, did, you, did you see Hans Jenny, Vibrating World, at the ICA in 1970? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, I must have. I must have. I'm going to. Do. It was wonderful because um, he had all these membranes in a in a vitrine, uh, of with sand all over the membranes, and then they played one sound in a different sound in each vitrine, and all the sound came into wonderful patterns. Mm -hmm. That was 1970, and I, 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 that was one of the most important things I ever saw in my life it, because I don't, I don't know if i saw that hans, <laughs> well, it's on the internet it's on the internet hans jenny vibrating world now uh, oh i think i've seen that recently actually ah right yes right. somebody somebody put on, um, um, I, I think i don't know on facebook or something i, I yeah. definitely saw that recently yes yes no it's beautiful absolutely absolutely beautiful, beautiful. yes, yes. And it, i mean it, but, but recently, uh, I've been also working with the moon. Um, the moon. Yes, well, not so recently, actually in 91, and then it yes. has um, sort of come forward. Yeah. And what I've, my idea was, actually, I've, uh, this idea came to me, I was in Paris, and my idea was that um, I would walk out 
one evening and there would be the full moon and right across the surface would be the word G, just yes. written right across the surface so that everybody could see it. Uh, and, you know, a bit like Woody Allen's Mother in the Sky, I don't know if you saw the film, this was she written very large on the moon. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I really thought, well, maybe, I wonder if I could do that, you know? And I started investigating how to do that. Lovely. And, <laughs> and I think today, is today full moon? I think today maybe no, is full no, moon. No, Friday. Friday. Friday full moon, yes. Next Friday. No, no, last Friday was a full moon. This Friday, we just passed a full moon. Well, um, it was only Friday. just passed. Well, maybe it was for, anyway, I, I've, I've just, I've just finished it. what I was saying. Um, yeah. The, um, because this was so difficult to do, yeah. I ended up doing it digitally online. Oh, right. And um, I've developed with a couple of people, one of whom was an astronomer, a program where you, you, you can see the moon yeah. every day the way it is in the sky mm -hmm. online on my website. Or, you know, if you have a screen and buy the software in your living room. And with the word she written on it, but the sun, the movements of the sun, the earth and the moon changed that word. Yes. And for the course of a lunar cycle, it becomes he in English. Yes. It becomes he, I've investigated this in 13 languages. It does not become he in French. <laughs> Uh -huh. no. <laughs> <laughs> you can only do it in 13 languages and it switches, goes back and forth between he and she. And I, I, I felt that this was very important because it was kind of <clears throat> cosmic movements actually bringing together opposites, bringing together uh, gender opposites and, and kind of showing that they're completely entwined. Um, uh, so that that that's a work that's quite recent. I think I, I've spoken about my work enough. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to say one thing. I think your book is fantastic, and I'll tell you why. In the '60s, because I was doing kinetic poetry, uh, and I was really there wasn't anybody else doing that at the time. Um, I, so my these kinetic poems were published. You know, I. I People asked me to be in shows. I was in quite a few major concrete, ex uh, uh, concrete poetry exhibitions. And I always thought, well, where are the women? You know, I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. There may have been one other woman, Lily Greenham was also exhibited, but very few other women, practically nobody. Uh, you know, and it was, I found it really disturbing. And through the years, I mean, it's not just then, it's just continued and continued, you know, and... You know. I, I have to say, I think this year, dead right. <laughs> it was shocking to me. I was, um, when I was first writing about um, concrete, I did this thing on Ian Hamilton Finley and then Ed Reinhardt and Robert Lacks. They were only men. No one ever mentioned you women out there who were working, this was in the 70s. This was, you know, like, yeah. it was just um, man's world. Well, it definitely was a man's world. Yeah. <laughs> but um, we have to remember, um, Mirella Bentivoglio contacted me because we were both in the question mark concrete poetry exhibition in Amsterdam in 1969 and she wrote to me immediately afterwards and she did a huge amount I think in Italy the she position did. of women was better because I, I, I have in my own not really not really well, I really. think somewhat better <laughs> but what not really I mean Mirella Mirella was very active Yes. And she, she, she actually did a, a show of uh, women concrete poets for the Biennale. It was sort of yes. called the Biennale. Yeah, I was in that. I, I, yes. I, know, I, knew, I knew Mirella, she passed away, but I knew her quite well. 
Yes, I you have. Know, a very strong person, you oh, know. Oh, wonderful, you know. wonderful, Mirella. You know, Mirella. Yes, I talk to Mirella all like the time. That, but, uh, not many, you know, and no. it, it was very hard to do that. I think I when know. someone has such a strong spirit, you can't believe in their death. I talk to Mirella frequently. And I'm sure she understands me. She, look, we're doing this through wavelengths and you can't see the waves. Well, I believe other people's spirits, are, are, they're there. They're just in another wavelength. Yes. I don't know. I don't know what happens to consciousness. <laughs> why, you think, why do you think women were not included or mentioned? By the men, what, I, I, I keep. Why, is, why are there very rich people and very poor people? You know, mm -hmm. you know. Why have black people been, you know, right? But what's the way they have been? Why, yes. why? You know, you can continue asking that. There's always the underdog. You know. Well, I don't. I think concrete is a bad. Is kind of when I see the word concrete, I think male. There's something about concrete <laughs> that isn't, I don't know. I don't want to say, <laughs> but I know, but I did not know. Mm -hmm. you, I mean, this is marvelous now, but then I did not know. And I'm trying to figure out, I mean, when you talk about vibrations, which I really do believe in, and that there <laughs> are spirits out there, Telepathy. I mean, my um, my work. I feel like they're uh, not just me or, or not my voice, but I'm I am you know an intermediary for other voices and bits and letters and vibration is the is actually is what it is. It's essential, and that word explains to me the mystery of those late manuscripts of Dickinson. It's all vibration. And, but concrete is not vibration. That's, that's. Well, it, of course, we're thinking of cement. Yeah. <laughs> I, that's why I, or, or hard fact, or the con, you know, con the concrete. Sort of, yeah, so that it is interesting that, uh, that possibly women would have thought that concrete wasn't exactly what they were doing, you know. No, that's what I mean, that we're slipping from, it's not just the letter, how cool they look on them, but we're slipping into sound, we're slipping into music, we're slipping into meaning. I mean, what is meaning? What are those, what are those letters mean on the page? What, what is, you know, just meaning itself? Well, absolutely. And if I may say something, I think also when I did the poem machines, meaning was lost. In other words, you, you didn't, you couldn't understand what was happening. There were these vibrations, yeah. right? Uh, but the thing is that meaning was still there. Yeah. So there was what I called potential meaning. And, and, and that's also, I think, very interesting the potentiality of meaning, you know, right. that there is meaning even when you don't actually. Well, there has to be meaning somewhere. You either, there is fact. <laughs> and I mean, that's the great thing again about Dickinson, where it, it, just looking at a late fragment, there is one line or three words that are riveting, that are, are concrete, that just fit, that are unforgettable, that, fix so there's meaning and fluttering and uh, uh, anyway i think it's it's women are there's, there's something interesting about that i i don't want to make gender specific you know specific separations but <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I, thank you so much for this. I keep thinking of, of something I encounter, um, um, I can't remember, I think it's uh, Rachel Blau du Plessis in an essay talks about how poetry and words are bottomless tangibilities. Mm. I just love that phrase, bottomless 
tangibilities because they are there, but once you start digging in, they're bottomless, these vibrations. Um, but I, so I wanted to ask you um, about temporalities and then, um, and then we should, and Catalina Ladique will also perform, but I don't want to interrupt this conversation that very spontaneously has taken place. And this is a conversation we should be having, of course. Um, and the question is, in some cases, a lot of the women in our book were and young campus, I think. collaborators. They were close collaborators of the men. So the fact that they didn't include them in a lot of things is just mind boggling to me because it's not like they had to discover them. They were in their milieu. So in, in a sense, I wonder how much had to do with also just ideas being in the air later after the manifesto. So the, 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 the manifestos are from the 50s. So in the 60s, the ideas are in the air. And then later in the 70s, they take different forms. And how much of your own practice responds to the ideas in the air, but not necessarily an allegiance to the way in which this field had been articulated. Uh, but maybe that is, um, I'll just leave that question there and we can return to it after Catalina. Yeah, let's see it um, We are so happy that Catalina is joining us from Budapest. Are you ready, Catalina? Yes? Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so I will just say a few words on, on, on her. Um, she is, she works with collage vocal performances that often incorporate folk music traditions. She was in, included in Documenta 14 in 2017, where she improvised a choreographic vocal performance based on the female figures of Greek mythology. So we return to myth also. That will be a really interesting conversation to follow. Um, and I will just read you um, something that the curator of, the, of Documenta wrote on her work, which also seems very pertinent. We see the language of Ladique's body as a main instrument in her performances on stage. In shamanistic gatherings in 1960s Novi Sad, where she practiced, and as a stark yet seductive presence at happenings, yet the most exquisite part of her language, of her body, we hear the voice. It vibrates, shrieks, rotates, comes from the head, the throat, the belly. All the high and low tones manifest in Ladique's great instrument. Um, from the early 70s on, Ladik transformed found materials such as sewing instructions, newspaper clippings, and computer circuits into visual scores for musical performances. So we will hear one now, um, but I also want to point to a novel that she wrote, an experimental novel published in 2007, so it's quite recent. And it's called, I cannot pronounce uh, the, the, the title of the, of the original, but it's called in English, Can I Live on Your Head? Uh, no, sorry, can, can I live on your face? And it is partly autobiographical and incorporates photography, newspaper clippings, and correspondence. Um, so I'll put it in the chat in case uh, people are interested in tracking this. And please help me in welcoming Katalin. A lot of thanks for this nice introduction. And I'm very happy that I met with my colleagues here a művésznőkkel, akik a 60-as években kezdték, és akkor írták a, a, a költeményeiket, amikor én is. Uh, very glad that I, I met here my generation, who started their 60s. art in 60s. And I am. As, as Catalina. Yes. A 60-as, 62-ben kezdtem el költőként létezni. Uh, she started to uh, uh, write uh, poetry in 62. És már akkor úgy éreztem, hogy ki, aki ki szeretném a költészet határait tágítani. Uh, she felt that uh, poetry uh, as traditional poetry is not enough. For me. It uh, for her it has to be extended in some way. Yeah. És 62 óta úgy írtam a verseket, hogy írtam a lineáris verseket, párhuzamosan uh, vizuális verseket és hangkölteményeket. 
uh, she started to write poetry since uh, 62, the, in traditional way, the linear poetry, and then visual poetry and sound poetry. És az első verses kötetem már uh, tartalmazta ezeket a ezt a három fajt, a, a lineáris költészetet, a, a vizuális költészetet és a hangköltészetet is, mert egy hanglemez, kis, kis bakelit lemezt mellékeltem az első kötetemhez, ami 69-ben jelent. Uh, uh, her first volume appeared in uh, 69, uh, containing the traditional poetry and the sound poetry as well, because a, a small vinyl was uh, 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 was, was included in the and audio. visual poems too. És azért kezdtem, én Nyugoszláviában éltem, és multikulturális közegben éltem. És én magyarul írok, magyar az anyanyelvem, és úgy éreztem, hogy hogy ez túl kicsi ahhoz, hogy kifejezzem magamat. So she, uh, uh, her environment in Yugoslavia was a multicultural environment, but she felt that uh, uh, since her uh, yeah. mother tongue, her mother tongue is Hungarian, that oh. the Hungarian as a minority uh, language in Yugoslavia is too small uh, to reach to reach a larger audience. És úgy gondoltam, hogy úgy érem el a, hogyha vizuális költészel és hangköltészettel is megpróbálom kifejezni az az poetikámat. She thought to reach, to reach this much larger audience, uh, the best way is, is to, uh, to use visual poetry and sound poetry. A vizuális költészetben nem hangsúlyos annyira a magyar nyelv, de a hangköltészetben mindig a magyar nyelv dallamát és a magyar nyelvnek a, 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 a magyar nyelvet használom, hogy, hogy átadjam a, a magyar nyelvnek a jellegzetességeit. In visual poetry is not so important the language. Wait, 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 I lost it. I lost it again. <laughs> no, it's not. We can see you. Én azért mondom, jó? Fontos a nyelv, a vizuális történet. De a, én a magyar nyelvet elsősorban a hangban próbálom megőrizni. In sound poetry she uses the language, the mother tongue, the Hungarian. And uh, all, all her uh, sound poetry oh. is in Hungarian. Mm. A könyvben megjelenő művek, azok uh, tipikusan um, női motivumokból áll, tehát a szabás mintákból, amelyek vizuális költeményként léteznek, de én zenei partitúraként is használom őket, mert leénekelem őket. Uh, a visual, uh, visual college is all as scores. I use the idea scores, and she Uh, she music. sings. She music sings as a music, uh, the the concrete poetry, the visual, the visual poetry that serves as a score. Most gondoltam, hogy egy magyar nyelven írt a horror kis mesémet versemet mondom el, amely a a gyermek gyermek mesének a formáját és a hangulatát adja, de a tartalma az horror tartalom. És ezt fogom most előadni. She will present now uh, a fairy tale, a horror type of fairy tale, uh, which uh, contains all the typical motives of uh, children, uh, children tales, but it's uh, full with horror elements, and this is what she wants to present. As, as sound poems. The white bird. A fehér madár. 
A csontból nem sokára szép fehér madár lett. Felszállt, és ezt énekelte. Anya megölt, apa meg Kis testvére Maruska összeszedte csontocská. Tette bucfó a tövibe, s ötötte sejjen kettőbe. Tette bucfó a tövibe. Thank you so much. Lovely. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Entrancing. It really was. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. It just shows you how much to communicate through sound and your face, your, your expressions are wonderful. Thank you. This was, uh, this was beautiful. Yeah. And um, to, to, to continue, we, have, we are very lucky to be able to welcome Julia Nikolai. So we're, here we're trying something. Um, we're, we're trying something over the phone because um, Julia Nikolai is able to, to reach and speak to us through the phone. So we will try to, to see um, if the, the connection, if you can, can hear uh, Julia and I. And we thought that we, will, we would discuss about Humpty Dumpty. So Humpty Dumpty is the poem that is um, selected and, and, and presented in the anthology. So I will, I'll put Humpty Dumpty, some, the pages on the screen so you can see the yeah. poem. And then I will um, join, I will join um, uh, Julia Nicolai to, to speak about the poem. So uh, hello, hello, Julia. Hello, good evening. Uh, I'm very happy to hear you. and uh, very happy to be in your colony, which is beautifully made. And um, so I'm, I'm very happy, that's it. Well, th thank you for, for being with us. We are here with a, a lot of friends, uh, about 113 friends, and among which uh, Paula Claire, Susan Howe, Lillian Vine, Kathleen uh, Ladik is here with us, and uh, Monica De La Torre, who we, uh, we co-edited the, the book together. Fantastic, uh, yes. And, and Benjamin Torel from the After Eight uh, Books Bookshop, and as well as um, uh, James Hoff from Primary Information. So we're, we're all here together. And um, here for New York. Uh, I, I am I'm in, in the forest in the southeast of Paris. And then there's people all, all over the world. Monica is in New York. And then great, pa great, pa Paula. Uh, the whole world is here. Yeah. And, then, and I think, we, about, yes, and, and yes. I think we, we hear you quite well. So what I propose is that we, I'm going to display on the screen um, the Humpty Dumpty uh, poem. So, um, so then you can, um, we can, we can talk about it because I was really curious about the, the process of how you, um, how you, uh, worked on the, on the poem, how you conceived it. And, um, and I think that then, uh, just a few seconds until I, I browse through the book, uh, through the digital book to, uh, get to, uh, Humpty Dumpty. Uh, right. How, how you wanted to talk now or yeah later? yeah now i think if you if you're oh, if, if, if you want to talk well, um, um, uh, i 
uh, was born in Italy. My father was Italian and my mother was American and she had never learned Italian. So she always spoke to me in English, but she was the only person to do so. So actually I started answering her at about uh, uh, seven years of age when evidently I felt I, I knew enough English to be able to speak. And um, my relation with English, I said this, because my relation with English uh, is very much uh, related to this fact, in the sense that it was my second language and at the same time, it was also my first language, being it the language of my mother, which though I, I started using a little later than I had used Italian. So, uh, because of this, uh, many, many um, things uh, uh, of the language itself uh, came to mind. And I'm telling you this uh, because the first poem, which is uh, Ajar and Ajar, in the sense Ajar as open, the idea of the coincidence of Ajar, which is Ajar, <laughs> was an absolute delight for me. Now, these things happen in just about any language uh, has uh, certain games that, that one realizes of, of, of the language itself. But uh, uh, I was very, um, how should I say, um, um, interested and attracted by this, uh, and absolutely because uh, English was slightly uh, more foreign to me than Italian, as Italian was spoken to me by everybody, and English only uh, by my mother. So uh, I became very quickly, um, how should I say, aware of a situation like a jar being a jar, no? the, the, the jar being open. And uh, these uh, things uh, amuse me immensely in English uh, in the same way that uh, uh, the other things amuse me very much in Italian. So I think that uh, the, double, the double language in which uh, the two languages with which I grew up uh, were a great help in teaching me to play games uh, with words. Yeah. And, um, well, uh, as you see, we have a jar, and then uh, we have uh, the vocatives, uh, oysters, uh, and, uh, and mouse, uh, which uh, I, it amused me to, to transform them in all sister or news. Um, and this uh, capacity, or the, this, uh, how should I say, not capacity, this amusement in slightly changing words and finding another meaning of them also is a thing which is partly due to my double language in which I grew up. Now, jugglers is obvious. And uh, yes, then the fact that they fail as, um, as a part of uh, of the, the body of a dog, let's say, and tail, tell me a tail, um, are, uh, um, you say, you pronounce in the same way, but are different, are, little, are, are written differently. This too is uh, um, an awareness uh, which for me was important because you don't have the same thing, thing happening in Italian. So again, uh, to say that uh, the two languages helped me in uh, realizing very soon uh, certain uh, um, 
aspects uh, of, of both, both languages, uh, like English or Italian. Now, for instance, uh, of course, uh, to tail off, uh, it doesn't exist uh, a, a similar situation as tail and, uh, and put them together, tail off is a go away. And, um, and so these things help me then to go on and to see backwards as the opposites, as the opposites, opposites that is drocad, which is drocad backwards, exactly, backwards. Um, neither, I don't know if you want me to go on with this uh, or if uh, what I said is sufficient because basically these are the, 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 um, the technique I use in, in, in Humpty Dumpty. Then I uh, naturally topsy-turvy, I wrote uh, upside down and jabber jabbered, I put uh, in the little uh, um, in, in, the, in the space uh, of, of, of words uh, and phrases of comic strips. Then bounce, uh, we have uh, the old bounces and Humpty Dumpty, we have a hump and a dump. Uh, Intranetability <laughs> is all together because of the, the, the meaning of the word and then we have unicorn. And uh, I did it uh, on Lewis Carroll because um, uh, I had been read. Uh, I had been I had been read um, uh, Lewis Carroll uh, by my father um, when I was a child. But when I picked it up again uh, in the beginning of the sixties. I realized uh, all the fantastic play and words uh, it had, uh, and uh, a lot of poetry I have already written had the same tendency of the play and words. So these uh, first books, this first book uh, uh, that I have been read, uh, that had been read to me. Uh, when I was uh, a small child of five or six, uh, uh, stayed with me all my life, uh, and my own writing became uh, very similar to the sort of uh, um, word games uh, that are in the book itself. Well, now I, yes. Yeah. Thank. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, it's it's a very um very enlightening to see uh, to, to see also uh, the different uh, aspects and then di dimensions of, uh, of the and how come exactly exactly and uh, exactly i thank you very much yes uh, maybe maybe a question because i think we we have now um you know we, we read we listened we felt energies and vibrations during this uh, uh hour and a half together and maybe to introduce a, a, a set of questions as well and maybe that can start a, a discussion between uh, uh, all of us um, I, I wanted to ask you also because you're you're a photographer, you're an editor, you're a publisher, and you were also very involved with translation and very involved with um, important um, important projects such as Tam Tam and uh, and Geiger as well. Yes. So um, yes. could, could you tell us a bit about um, your your publishing work and how you were involved uh, in in these groups as well, which were collective adventures? Right. Well, that was. Uh very, very important and loads of fun, also in relationship uh, with uh, authors, visual, visual authors or um, uh, linear uh, authors, uh, they say in the States, in Japan, and obviously in France, Germany, and England, and Spain. Mm -hmm. Allora, uh, that is, uh, we who were in the country, if we found a phone uh, um, then, uh, but we had uh, contacts uh, um, 
in the whole world and uh, in a sense uh, of great uh, how say a fellowship uh, a brotherhood uh, because the work we were doing was the same and it was the same uh, in South America in Japan uh, and in Europe and this uh, gave us uh, a great feeling uh, of having managed uh, to overcome the boundaries uh, of languages uh, and um, uh, we enjoyed it immensely and felt uh, very very close uh, to all the other authors and many of them uh, we met uh, sooner or later uh, in various uh, circumstances circumstances or meetings uh, uh, here and there, uh, all over Europe, uh, and also the United States. Okay, and and also what we were we were discussing about the um, the presence and representation and and uh, the work of women in these groups in these collectives um, in Italy and internationally. So, um, what what could you tell us about um, the way you felt uh, women were represented or included or um, present in the in the work of those uh, times? Dunque, ah, I never know if I am too optimist in saying something or too pessimist in saying something else. And I can say the two things. Uh, in a way, um, in, in visual poetry and in poetry, uh, women were much less than men. But the fact that we were so much less, in a way, was um, uh, positive because we created in interest just because there were few of us. Now, I don't know if uh, actually, if I remember the poet women, uh, in both in burial and in sound poetry, there weren't many. So it is understandable that there were so few in relation to men. But uh, we were uh, received uh, well, uh, basically, in the things written. This is why I'm so interested in this anthology, because it's all on women. Basically, when you have uh, um, uh, written articles on men and women, the, the men are always considered more important. <laughs> and so uh, I find that this anthology is, has a great importance uh, in underlining the work of women. Well, thank you, thank you for um, for for these words, and um, uh, we are we are here together with uh, with the audience and the public, and so um, now it's 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 great to to open the the conversation to the public. So you, you can you can stay uh, with us if you want, uh, uh, Julia, on the phone. And um, what we can do is, if uh, any of you have questions, you can both um, uh, so so speak those questions and say them, but also use the chat, and we can also do a mediation with, together with Monica. With great pleasure, yes. Thank you, dear Julia. So yeah, who, you, I would like to say something to Julia, please. Is that so, okay? Yeah. The, so, can Julia, Julia, can Julia can, hear me? Julia, can you hear um, Paula Claire? Hello, Julia. Uh, yes, 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 I, I say so. I... Well, what is strange is that my father brought me up on Alice in Wonderland and uh, through the looking glass, and I live now just a few hundred yards from Christchurch where Lewis Carroll lived. And he was hugely important to me because of all the surreal uh, ideas and the mouse's tail. It had a big influence on me as well. So that is a wonderful coincidence. It had a huge influence on me too. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and, and also I have to add that um, James Joyce uses Humpty Dumpty and of course knew so many languages 
and, and Lewis Carroll is a big, very important for James Joyce. I mean, I, I, he's interesting in, in this context. Yes. But I think I, I, women and nursery rhymes, I mean, I happen to think that Beatrix Potter was a great poet. Oh. I think that <laughs> Peter Rabbit is a masterpiece. Lovely. Both the drawings and the writing. And I don't know, I just think I, there's some, I don't know, I, I feel there's something interesting in, um, in, in nursery tales and punning and yes. exactly those funny changes in language in, that one word can mean two things. Yes. Um, so it's very, <laughs> the whole fairy tale um, nursery rhyme subject uh, for women is is particularly interesting, I think. Right, because maybe also because um, women traditionally would be more involved in language transmission and reading to their children. So already that, that yeah. performance element, right, is magnified too because the child can't read. So the mother- I remember is being read to as a child yeah by your mother or father but 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 mm. you what were you were read to what you were read was fairy tales and um nursery rhymes and beatrix potter <laughs> at least i was um what interests me is that when you speak to a baby you start to speak in a sort of sound poetry voice what's yes. called a silly voice but you speak to a child because you are you are uni you're uniting their sounds with your language so so there's an interim sort of language where the baby starts to understand communication through the basic sounds and it's automatic. When you speak to a baby, you start saying, ah, hello, 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 instead of hello, hello. And the child will laugh. And they go, ah, and then you, oh, and that's the basic communication. And to me, it's the essence of the sound poetry. <laughs> That'll shut you up. I know, I think it's true. <laughs> I love speaking to babies. It's gorgeous. And this well, that's why this Hungarian reading was so beautiful. It was just so thrilling because yeah. what she's doing is, is, is some breaking these uh, words into vibration. Yes. 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 Really and just that uh, beautiful, I thought that was. So powerful. Also, I, I, I'd love to know what everybody imagined the fairy tale was about, because we might all be in the same zone. <laughs> it was so interesting. It was like, I, I felt like that fairy tale was transmitted to me, even though I have no clue what it was about. Um, I wanted, on the subject of language, um, which of course we've been discussing, in vibrations, I wanted to acknowledge the presence of some of the translators of the work in the anthology who are here. Um, so I want to very much thank Alta Price, who, um, and, and Alex Zucker, I think Al Alta just left, but I wanted to say that Alta came to my rescue in the middle of the pandemic where I needed to have access to a text by Mireya Ventivoglio that was nowhere to be found. And then I realized that Alta Price had translated it for an issue of Tinted Window in which you appear, Paula. Oh yeah. to Materializzazione del Linguaggio. Yes. And so Thanks to Alta, I had access to a beautiful translation and it came to me in the middle of the night and it oh. was, it was, I didn't need to go to any shutdown, lockdown, bookstore or library. So thank you, Alta and Alex Zucker. They both translated uh, Bohumila Grogerova. All right, yes. That was an incredibly nuanced, complex translation project. So if Alex is still here, maybe he wants to talk about it. The other translator who is here tonight, it, tonight for you and uh, midday for us, Hilary Kaplan, who translated a lot of the Brazilian and Portuguese uh, materials, among mm -hmm. the very difficult work of Salet Tavares. Mm -hmm. 
in the anthology. Um, incredibly complicated. She spent so much time. Thank you so much, Hillary. I hope you're still here. Um, and I also want to acknowledge um, Meredith Moran, who is here, who helped me with a lot of research on your biography. So thank you very much for being here. If she's still here, I don't know. Um, questions. Does the audience have questions? Alex, do you want to tell us a little bit about Grogerova and translating her? I don't want to put you on the spot if you don't want to. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I, I thought this might happen. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I just want to say how much I've been enjoying this. I really don't like Zoom, but it, I've had twice in the past week. I've had fun experiences on Zoom, which I didn't think was possible. So I want to thank mm, everybody I, who's I agree. made that happen today. Everybody who's been sharing their, uh, the poets who have been reading their work and sharing it with us. Um, so I, I, I can't say too much about Gregorova as a poet uh, or a person because I had heard of her before, but it's not as if I was familiar with her work. Um, but when Monica asked me uh, if I wanted to translate these poems and she sent them to me and I said, you know, she is a, Ch a Czech poet, but um, half of these poems are in German. And um, one was in a French, German, uh, Czech and English, or was it French, German and English? So I, I, but Alta Price, who, who has left a uh, meeting already, is in a translator's collective together with me called Sedilla or Sedia. And so I asked um, Alta if she would be interested in co-translating it with me, which made it even more fun. Um, and I guess uh, I just, it was just really, um, I have translated poetry before, but not concrete poetry. And of course it was fun to reproduce the effects on the page. And uh, yeah, there it is, figure out how to do that. But the funnest thing that I can mention is that one of the poems um, was titled, it had, it had a twin title in English. Yeah, so that's one that, um, actually that Alta translated. I mean, I looked at it too, but it was written in German. So the weight of it uh, fell to her. Um, and, and that's an excerpt from um, uh, um, the book that's called in English America by, by Franz Kafka. Uh, and it's a ship, we believe, a ship sailing to America. And then this one is this uh, alphabet from Ulysses. Oh, yes. Yeah which is um, fragments from um, the Czech translation of Ulysses, James Joyce's Ulysses. So hmm. I thought, well, I mean, of course I could go ahead and I can find, I can figure out where those fragments are in the English and retype them. <laughs> but that didn't really seem to me to be what a translation would be about, and it certainly wouldn't be an artistic one. So honestly, um, I can't even remember exactly how I came up with the idea, but there's a, probably the most famous Czech novel of the 20th century was a book called The, the Good Soldier Schweik, which was written by an author named Jaroslav Hasek and just coincidentally happens to have been published in the same year and was translated into English I'm not, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to mess up my own information now. Monica, do you remember? Because this is what happens when you are prepared. Was it translated into English also the same year as, uh, as Ulysses was translated? Yes. Finally, what you did was found the house. Seniorial privilege answered the latter, unlocking the gate. Mm -hmm. Conferred by the sovereign upon Squire Winsel Tronka. What is this? So, oh, queer. Huh. So anyway, what I did was I did, I did go ahead and do the version, which was just finding the fragments in the English, uh, more or less, you know, I had to, I couldn't just choose the exact same fragments because they had to begin and end with the 
each subsequent letter in the alphabet. But I went ahead and I, and I did it for the good soldier Schweik as well, using the first translation into English, um, which chronologically was the, the one that corresponded. And so that was fun. Um, and that felt much more satisfying to me as, a, as an act of translation. And uh, I guess I would say a work of art. So that's what I have to say about that. Yeah, so, you, so um, in a way you transcreated the piece to use Haroldo de Campos' language, right? You transcreate yeah. this translation. Yeah. It's interesting that this work in particular from Job Bodge, and I'm probably mispronouncing it, uh, circulated so much in a lot of the main translation, I mean, the main publications, like in the Futura series, the Hans Jörg Meyer, and people see it and it looks really interesting, but I, it never was translated. It hasn't been published alongside a translation. So it, the, 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 the whole operation of Grogrova and Hirsal is lost on the reader. So I, I'm very grateful for this translation. Yes, very much. Um, thank you so much, Alex. And sorry to put you on the spot. You did great. <laughs> I wonder if, I wonder if Hillary wants to tell us a little bit about Salet Tavares. I'd be and, happy to. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, Alex, it was so wonderful to hear you talk about how you were able to um, create those translations. I fortunately did not have um, the challenge of having to actually replicate the, uh, the visual aspect of the poem because um, I don't know if I could have uh, done it as so quickly. <laughs> um, but these were, it, it was such a pleasure for me to translate for this amazing book um, because these writers and artists were new to me. And so that was just a whole world that opened up. Um, Tavares from Portugal, I mean, this, look at this little spider. You can see on the right, this little spider. Um, and its legs are made of pieces of the word for spider, aranha, and then the, it gets broken down and then it gets expanded. Um, and if you can zoom back out, um, Alex, I don't know if we can look at the whole page, but we basically have, so this is the, Taki Taki, which is actually, you know, English, Taki 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 Talk. Um, but this is also Takicardia. So Takicardia, and it's just broken down into its letters. And then the one next to it is, I think it was Humu, like the sound. And um, I mean, I, I'm not exactly remembering exactly what I translated everything as, but it's basically taking words, breaking them down into their sound components. And then the translation project was to try to sort of piece back together what were the major words and their most um, recognizable components. And then there's another, the next page I think is the pop page. Um, oh no, the F page. Okay, so this page is all words with F and the form um, F's also, and then this one was super fun um, because it's the aleatory composition. And at the top, there is this po 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 sound, which is the sound that a car makes, like the gas coming out of a car. Um, and then there's also parla patis broken down into circles and squares, as you can see. And, and Tavares. Um, created her own spellings for words. So she would change certain letters around. Um, and so I think like the, the I is different than it was supposed to be, or the SSE was different than it was supposed to be. Monica, you probably re remember this better than I do. Um, but she created her own spellings and some of that has had to do with how um, she would pronounce words versus how they were traditionally written. So a number of these poems are dealing with 
um, words as she spelled them and how that changes the meaning of the word. Thank you so much. Yeah, these these were just a trip, really fun. And it's it's almost like they're so there's like so many poems on these. They were broadsides. So here you don't have one poem, you have like five poems in one. <laughs> right, very modular approach. So yes, thank you so much for tackling that. And thank you for telling us about the process. Really illuminating. What about you, what about you Monica, about uh, translating this? Because you have also done some translations and one amazing one is uh, Anna Hatherley. Uh, Anna Hatherley's work, Lenorana. So um, do you want to say a couple of words about that? Uh, yes, sure. Um, if you want to jog my memory. Yeah. And, so um, what Hatherley does in this beautiful serial work is take some lines from, poem, from a poem by Luisa Camoez, um, the super, like the most important Portuguese writer uh, of the, what is it, like post-Renaissance, very important national writer. And she takes this, these lines and starts um, performing variations on them. So there's riffs. So you have, uh, maybe we, we could just, so those are the Camoes lines and then we can go down. And so the poem becomes like very Baroque here. And then the language and the syntax start getting stripped down. Um, and the poem becomes more and more concise. Then she incorporates handwriting into the variations. So here, oh, if you just go up to the for, to the variation with the with the neologisms, yeah, this one variation ten is really interesting. It's very Joycean. Here she's just and, and, yeah coming up with neologisms that sound really interesting but mean nothing. So I had to recreate that in English, and I just first I was trying to approach it mentally and trying to analyze how these were formed and what effect they were having on me. And they look like words, but they're not words. So in order to arrive at that in English, I realized that I couldn't follow a rational process. I just had to improvise, ad lib it. And it actually, and then it happened really fast. And uh, it's, yeah, it's kind of combinations of words. Like, so honoros, candle goes, allscape, onorient, sparse, elors, alora, alsafa, alsavli, Onarudi, Onilor, I can't, uh, yeah, I can't read the whole thing because it's, it's a little, um, it's, it's, yeah, too small. <laughs> Leo were Onoral, so Leorovli, Alsa Rose, Lovely Full, Paralina, Theolor. It's parts, it's fragments of words then put together. But maybe Alex, if you could show us the, um, just the handwritten variations so these are very concrete then you have diagrams mm -hmm. more letterist kind of compositions this one this one is quite beautiful as well um just with the blank space the variation 27 the poem disappears oh, yeah. lovely. yes and uh yeah. in that case she had a really beautiful description for what that for what that is let me find it um in the oh, then we become yeah in the empty one, so so she she has maybe maybe we can leave it there. So she has uh, descriptions of what the procedure for each variation is, and I translated those that appear at the back. And the one that has the empty page simply says, "Variation seventeen is an absolute distancing from the image." So she's playing with coming up close to the image and distancing the poem from the image mm -hmm. by engaging in more sonic play okay. and more more baroque experimentation and i just love the fact that an empty page would be the absolute distancing from the image mm -hmm. um and then she has this other one that's very interesting variation 21 maybe i'll read you that one also this one so this one looks like a it, it reads like a Latin plaque or something. Variation 21. In the centuries 
AD, we see the transformation of the concept of space into aesthetic factors, allowing luxurious dislocations on foot, the automobile element used by evolved primates in the sector of successive forests, much appreciated for the epidermic sensation referred to as lushness, which then provided individuals means of subsistence and of corporate organization to which was attributed the designation of lovely obscure edema whose adequacy was lost in successive semantic transformations. <laughs> L Lionor, age uh, 65, Latin, and yeah. But, and so um, the Camoes is barefoot she goes to the source through the lushness, Leonor, lovely she goes, but not surely. And those are the terms that she starts riffing off of. And the, the, the main problem for me was the word, uh, well, there were a number of them, but lushness. What she has is verdura, so a more, a closer translation would be greenery, but greenery didn't lend itself to the play that lushness did. So it appears in one of the poems, but I couldn't, it didn't yield as many, spin, it, like when I try to spin it off, it didn't yield as many other meanings, talking about the latency or the virtuality and potentiality of meaning, like that word keeps giving. It's, it's like the green, the greenness of the word keeps, producing more green and, and spawning and having more offshoot, offshoots, but, um, but lushness linguistically helped me um, arrive at, other, at, those, at those other points. So yeah, um, I can't say the translation is final because it's a very complex work. So it's in progress, but it was delightful to work on it. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. For asking. Thank you, Monica. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's such an incredible work of translation that you that you've done, and I think it's also the work of Anna Hatherley that we both really fell in, you know, some deep, deep, um, deeply impressed and deeply in love with. Um, it's, it's quite incredible uh, work. It's it's really quite nice. Uh, Anna Hatherley wrote a lot of theory as well about the history of poetry, and and this is an incredible essay called. Uh, para uma arqueologia de poesia experimental, uh, like studying history and, and uh, the, the Portuguese anagrams of the 17th century. So it, it's really quite interesting how the, the theory and practice sort of, sort of connected there. So I realize um, no questions have materialized in the chat and um, we at some point will have to... There, there's one question by a, f a friend who, a friend of mine who was, uh, who was shy to ask the question in person, but uh, who, uh, it's, it's actually a question to the poets and to, to all of you perhaps, um, uh, about the experience of getting in contact with this anthology, how it, how it is and how it was for you to uh, become familiar that, that this anthology existed and uh, how do you retrospectively, um, how does that sh shed a light on uh, the 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 time and uh, era of um, concrete concrete and visual poetry of of that time. Um, so both how you feel about this anthology, about how it how it sort of connects with that particular era. Um, you no, know, it's it's open to all of you too. To answer. <laughs> I think it's very surprising yeah, for me. <clears throat> I think for me, it, it was a great surprise. It was a great yeah. sort of, I, I, it was a pleasure to see so many different, diverse, uh, creative women working with language. Um. <laughs> I think it was a shocking surprise. It was... <clears throat> Uh, not um, shocking. Well, I mean, in a good way. In a good, but it was it was amazing. Yeah. I mean it's shocking in the sense I suppose that that um that it hadn't been done before. Yeah. But in a way also we we always knew that it had, it wasn't being done. <laughs> you know? It just wasn't being done, you know, and it was a very frustrating thing to live through uh, to know that there are a lot of uh, artists who are not having their voice heard or their voice seen <laughs> as it happens. It's I do think it's changing. 
Well, I hope it lasts. <laughs> evidence of that. I think the book is evidence of that. Yeah. Um, well, there must be a market for the book. What What is lovely is that it. I feel that it's the young generation who are now taking it all seriously, and they're actually believing in this term. I originally opened my archive as the International Concrete Poetry Archive, and Mirella came to Oxford in 1980 to formally open it. And then people hated the word concrete so much, I changed it in 1998 um, to the Sound and Visual Poetry Archive. But I've got far more visual than sound so I thought well that's not very accurate uh, and then and then someone said oh you ought to put your name in otherwise people won't recognize you so it then became the Paul Leclerc archive and finally I thought I've got to get it out of a ghetto I'll call it the archive from word to art but now I'm back again with concrete mm. <laughs> why do you think people hated the word so much Pardon? Why do you think people hated the word so much? Simply because the word concrete in English brings into mind horrible, dirty, brutalist buildings. In Oxford, we've got a great <laughs> big brutalist science block that I remember being built 45 years ago, and they've just knocked it down. And everybody says, thank God the concrete got so dirty, the architects didn't understand how it would weather in our wet climate. And so the, the people hate it. But of course, I always say, say it in French, la posi concrète. Did it sound sexy? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> True. <laughs> could I, I don't know whether I could come in at this moment just to say that I didn't say anything about the, the work that you published of mine and which is, you know, perhaps is a bit, um, you know, perhaps people don't understand what it is, you know, because it looks very pictorial. I'll, I'll put it on the screen just... I, suddenly occurred to me that I really ought to say something about this. <laughs> Please do, yes. Well, um, if you could put it on the screen, I'm just looking at them. Um, in, I started in 1971, actually, no, 60. <laughs> I started in 1965, I think. 64, 65, when I came to London, I was living in Greece, and I came to London, and um, in, a, in a stationary shop, I saw these wonderful, um, all these graphic elements that were for sale, and some of them were, were actually stationary. This one, for example, uh, is um, just kind of stationary, um, a letter, letter film, letter set. Um, I'm not even sure this is letter set. I think these were just tack-ons. Well, no, the lines, the lines are letter set and the, the squares are just things, you know, little, little rectangles you got, I got in the stationery shop. But they all were in stationery shops. It was very easy to get hold of these then. And uh, the other one, the one you showed before, if you go back again, which is for me more interesting, uh, these were all um, electronic symbols. And I, I, I just found them in these little packets and they were all electronic symbols. And I thought, well, that's a language, you know, that's speaking to people who want to do a particular thing. And um, I was very interested in the idea of using this, this language, which actually I, I didn't really understand myself, but, um, I found very interesting, very curious. Well, I, could, I, I knew what some of the symbols meant. Um, and so I, I used it to create different things. So this, this for example, is, is, is a house, is a, a bit of architecture, kind of the architecture uh, of, of these electronic symbols. But what then happened was that I thought of these in relation to the brain. And I thought that electronic symbols could actually be used as symbols for neurons. So I thought of, I called them neuro, neurographs because I thought of them as um, 
maps of the brain as opposed to maps of a of a, an electronic um, sort of panel. Uh, and there's a, there are a few more. Uh, that one, for example, and uh, that one, which I was one of my favorites, uh, which was a kind of goddess figure. Uh, <laughs> made up of a combination of electronic symbols and um, just basic uh, little triangles and arrows that came, that were letter set. But this, for example, the green ones were, so they're all sort of combinations of different symbols that, that are symbols, basically. It is language uh, mm -hmm. because um, all these symbols are part of the way we communicate. And, and, and so, um, in a sense, using them was actually communicating uh, as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I thought of these as um, neurographs. And a friend, of mine, this friend of mine, this poet, uh, beat poet, Sinclair Bayless, who was a South African poet, um, and who was schizophrenic, um, he, he, he came and stayed with me for a while in London when he didn't have a place to live. And um, he had written this, this manuscript, Deliria, um, when he was um, in, uh, oh gosh, now I've forgotten which clinic, but rather well-known clinic in London. And, um, and so I, I, I said, well, we could illustrate, I could illustrate it with these neurographs, which I did. But he was, he kind of spoiled the publication of it. I mean, it was going to be published, but he behaved rather badly. And in the end, it wasn't published. Um, so that, that was not, didn't happen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. That is so illuminating. I do have a question I want to ask. Is that okay, Alex? Yes, because, of course. Um, and I know, I, look, if I, if I were to be, remain my life in zoom land i would very much enjoy being trapped in zoom land with you <laughs> but we don't want to keep you here forever and it's getting late um one question that thinking about your work lillian makes me think about is um the circulation of the work so some of the neurographs have circulated more in the art world right and not in in the poetry world and Susan, you you went from art to the page back to art in a way when, oh, when you... I, mean, I, mean, I would say I'm still on I'm still on the page. Of course, of course, but the art. But I, I think it. I think it is um, art. Visual artists are more accepting of. Um, what you're doing of of this of using a page you know visual artists will accept this and are using words more and more in work yes they are it yes. is much it is not accepted um in the in the actual as to what a poem is Mm. Poems are to me, they're just like no experiment. <laughs> I mean, they're just meaning, meaning this line means this, 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 this. You, well, you're punished oh, if, in some way if you mess around with words. I mean, the kind of things that, that James Joyce or, or modernists were doing is not really being done anymore in a strange way. Um, and I, I don't know how to explain, like your words are kind of dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> They're not so dangerous to the art world. Mm. Um, so when I say that mm. made me- well, That's now. That, that sounds that, right. to interrupt you, but when I when I first uh, oh yeah I exhibited would. poem poem machines in yeah. Paris in sixty two I think or three, um, the, 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 there was a, no acceptance from the art world yeah at all 
Uh, well, it, wasn't, it wasn't that um, easy to... Uh, but what do you think, why do you think, I mean, it's a strange thing about words. Boundaries. And, and I found that very, um, I found that out when I uh, wrote Crossing Map, <clears throat> and, um, which is a, a, an epic poem, really. Mm -hmm. and but I, which I actually thought of as prose I thought of it as as experimental prose and yeah. um, but uh, the publishers said well this is this is poetry we don't publish poetry and then the yeah. poet po poetry publishers said yeah. it's too yeah. long we <laughs> don't publish long poems <laughs> no, no, sorry <laughs> no, it, it was very very difficult to find anybody who would yeah. publish it in the end Calder uh, uh, decided he would do it, um, and and then um, I I decided to draw every page. So I I did a a, a, a visual uh, version of the book, and I wanted to print them together. And Calder said, called the drawings decorations. He said, "Well, I'm glad you're decorating your book." I said, oh no, <laughs> I don't think I can publish with somebody who thinks my drawings are decorations. <laughs> so, so then uh, Thames and Hudson uh, seemed to like the whole thing, but actually they, they really only liked the visuals. <laughs> so they published it as an artist book, but actually they disregarded the text. No, that you've raised something really interesting to me. Right, Artist to books and poets books. There's two, there's two categories. It's so, I, I don't know how to explain it, but artist books are expensive. They will fetch a good price. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, maybe. Really I, cheap. Eight, it, no, nine, but I, well, I've had the experience that I, with an, if an artist combines with one of my crazy collage works, that's considered an artist book and that's okay. But if I just do my, great, my collage stuff, words, which I consider poems, that is not, that is considered like, but what does this mean? I've had more people, but just this doesn't mean anything. Mm. What I'm, you see what I'm saying? Meaning. <laughs> and yet, Susan, don't you think, I mean, the, the paradox is that in a way you've managed to garner incredible reception in the poetry world, and in part because you changed the rules of the game. Work like yours taught people to read it as poetry. And well, the had I not my beloved New Directions and my wonderful, you know, the people there who do any, you know, they, they work with me so wonderfully. And New Directions is a, it's a, it's a small but big, you know what I mean, it's a, it's a small press, but a big small press with a tradition that goes, harks back to very experimental work in the past. So I've been very, very lucky, but I couldn't have done it without New Directions. And I don't have an agent and, you know, uh, um, it's, it's just different. And I've been lucky. And the, the art world also has really embraced your work. And I'm very curious of Kathleen, what is your experience going from the page to the gallery to art exhibitions? Seems, um, can, you, can you tell us how it's been for you? Because it seems like um, the, the art world has embraced your work also quite well as of m more recently. So, I, so yeah, what happens to the written word or the scores? When, how do they circulate when that happens? Nálam a költészet az egyetemes. Uh, the, the poetry is universal. For me. Uh, tehát több dimenzióban létezik a költészet nálam, és a test is hozzá tartozik, mint instrument. Uh, the poetry is existing in uh, multiple dimensions, and uh, the body, the body is a, a dimension. Instrument. Instrument is an instrument. 
és a performanceimben használom a saját szövegeimet, nem csak magyarul, de artikulátlan, tehát a hangkörtészetet használom a performanceimben, ahol van látvány, tehát vizuális része, a színek, a fények, a, a szcéna, tehát az, az is fontos számomra, a tér, a tér nagyon fontos számomra. In performances of Katarin, she is, she is using the space, the colors, uh, 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 some texts from uh, her tradition of poetry. És az árnyék is nagyon fontos, Anna Shadow. Nagyon fontos az árnyék, amit a, fény, a fénytől, tehát a testem, amikor a háromdimenzió test, testem kétdimenziós formát képet a hátamnak. Uh, she has a, a very, very uh, uh, typical uh, performance, uh, Alice in Portland, where she is using the shadow as a two-dimensional two uh, shape uh, coming from a three-dimensional body uh, because uh, we are projecting projecting uh, um, the, code. uh, the codes the codes on the body of és ezeket a kódokat a testemen én interpretálom le előadom uh, and she uh, just uh, interprets uh, uh, sings the codes Uh, projected on her body and uh, the background. Engem nagyon érdekel az a titok, ami úgy koncentrálva van a kódokban, bár kód, meg vonalkód, és én ezt a képzeletemben megoldom és feltárom. Azért Alice a csodák országában, hanem Alice a kép a, a kódok országában. Uh, she's very very interested in, in this codes, in the secret of this codes. So what is behind the codes? And uh, the whole performance is about uh, exploring the meaning of the codes. De ez korábban keletkezett a női szabás minták, a, a divat magazinokban, a szabás mintáknak a vonalai. Az nekem Uh, szintén egy titkot rejtett, tehát egy kétdimenziós uh, térkép, vonal, ilyen ka kaotikus vonalrendszerből lesz egy háromdimenziós ruha. Nem tudom a szabás mintát. A score, the pattern. 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 Uh, uh, she, used, she used pattern uh, from the Burda uh, this... magazine. And, uh, magazine for women. Uh, magazine for design. women, yeah. And... Uh, and fashion, yes. and uh, uh, these lines, uh, lines of the patterns uh, are becoming three-dimensional. És a háromdimenziós mű lesz, műtárgy. És számomra a, 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 a test, az én testem, tehát a, a, az alkotó, a művész, mint műtárgy filozófiáját ezt magamiráltatom. A a a a a a a a egy performance. A script. It was a script. Before. Before. So before before was, was a script, script to a performance. This was a notation for sound and moving a hang modulat. Uh, uh, sound movement. Sa sound movement is uh, is very important in my performance. Beautiful. Thank you so much. So we have one question in the chat that maybe is a beautiful way to close. Um, Sean Gleason, I can read the question or do you want to ask it? Oh, you want me to read it? Okay, I will read it. So it says, are there discoveries that you've made about the world you were part of decades ago since this project started? 
And what feelings, vibrations do those discoveries evoke? I can read it again if you want. Yes, please. Are there discoveries that you've made about the world you were part of decades ago since this project started? And what feelings, vibrations do those discoveries evoke? Hmm, can't hear that one very well. That last word. What's that last word? Evoke. 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 Oh. Evoke. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's I, I, I think we have gone on rather a long time now. I think my brain's turned off now. <laughs> I need my tea and crumpets. I've got crumpets downstairs. <laughs> well, that seems like a beautiful ending. If not <laughs> I wish you could all come and have tea and crumpets. They're beautiful. Oh. With lots of French butter. Yeah. <laughs>